Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. We're coming to you live from the Salt Conference in New York City. Joining us for this segment, we have Ryan Mollett. He is the Global Head of Distressed and Corporate Special Situations at Angelo Gordon. We're going to discuss why it's a great market to arbitrage between the private and public markets. Ryan, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. All right, good to be here. Let's talk about the differences that you're seeing in the private and public credit markets. Yeah, so I was talking earlier on the panel, um, look, we, we, we like to just dynamically pivot in the business uh, between the public and the private markets, where we think the best risk reward opportunity is. And if you think about the back half of last year, um, you're really starting in, this, in, in, the, in the second quarter, you've seen a dislocation in the public markets. Um, when you see dislocated public markets, it's not a great time to be in private credit. Companies don't want to lock in that very high cost of capital. And so we were very focused on the public markets, um, invested in low dollar price bonds um, as a result of the rate move and the spread widening move. That changed a lot coming into this year. Um, as you know, companies have realized that this new cost of capital is going to be here for, for, for a little bit longer uh, at the very least, um, you're starting to have maturities. Um, you're starting to have liquidity issues. m and transactions need to happen. And so uh, the private market has really started to heat up. And so now what you actually have is a really attractive private market that is competitive with capital um, for what we're seeing in the public market. We see a really interesting bifurcation within the public market between good companies that are trading at, at, at levels that, are, that, that, that we really like from a risk reward perspective um, and companies that are trading at very similar levels that we think are going to have a lot of trouble over the next two to three years. And you're also seeing an insatiable, insatiable demand for flexible and solutions-based capital. <laughs> yes. what, what's that mean, solutions-based? Absolutely. Well, well, look, I think when you're thinking about a high yield market that yields 9% right now, um, you know, a little bit of illiquidity premium, a little bit of complexity premium, you're getting into that mid-teens cost of capital. And that's right into our strike zone of, of where we like to operate with this solutions-based capital. And so what you're seeing is any companies that have any sort of complexity, any sort of hair, they don't have access to the regular way high yield markets. They don't have access to the broadly syndicated leveraged loan markets. And so they're coming for us, uh, coming to us to provide that solution for them. Um, and that's exactly what our capital was intended to, to, to bridge the gap until they have access to a cheaper cost of capital uh, in, the, in the public market uh, environment. What about credit versus equity? <laughs> um, look, whether it's, whether it's the opportunities that we like in the public market or whether it's the opportunities that we like in the private market, I mean, just to put that in perspective, um, you know, private market deals that we're doing, uh, senior secured, less than 50% loan to value. Um, you're talking about kind of mid-teens returns. Um, and um, you, you're not taking a lot of risk relative to what I've seen throughout the last 10 to 15 years. And it's really a function of that movement um, in the base rate and the lack of, of the company's ability uh, to get cheap cost of capital in the broadly syndicated markets. And so, you take a mid-teens returns uh, with taking very little risk, very high up in the capital structure, investing in good businesses, being able to structure those deals, um, and compare that to the equity market. Uh, and if you look at a 15% IRR over a one, two, three year period, let's just take it over three years, um, you're talking about an S&P that's at 6,500. Uh, you know, that is hard to fathom. Um, you, can, you can kind of come up with situations where you say, all right, well, maybe this would happen, or, and maybe the equity market is cheap, and maybe you can get to that, those levels. Um, conversely, what we're doing in credit, it's, well, maybe you're, you're not going to get your contracted return. Uh, very, very low probability that's not the case. And so, you know, I think the dynamic has massively shifted in, in favor of credit right now, uh, where I think you can get actually excess returns and take less risk. You know what's interesting about this market is it's very bottoms up. <laughs> right, so it, it does make for some interesting you know, stock or credit picking, if you will. What industries or what areas of the market are you seeing opportunity? Yeah, so so you would think, um, all right, we're going into a recession potentially. Uh, you want to be defensive. You want to avoid cyclicals. Um, historically, when you think about the high yield market, you, you've seen uh, default cycles. You know, you had a 2000 that was uh, that was really dictated by telecom. Uh, you had 2015, 2016. That was energy. Um, here, what you have is, um, it's really, as, as you mentioned, Joe, it, it's a bottoms up credit pickers market. Um, and what we're seeing is, we're seeing stress in the system in many, many different companies in many different industries. And, you know, for example, um, if you think about healthcare, uh, telecom, you can say, well, those are largely defensive. Um, we're seeing a lot of stress in, in those sectors. Um, right now, energy, you'd say it's cyclical. Well, we're not seeing a, a, a lot of a, a stress. and so. Really, it, it's not a function of, of individual industries that, that we're seeing, but it is um, individual companies. And, and I think that that is um, a result of a lot of these balance sheets, a lot of these capital structures were put in place in a zero rate in interest rate environment. Um, they are not built for, for, for what we're looking at. Um, 
you know, just to put that into perspective, uh, big table, uh, bi uh, big telecom company uh, brought a senior secure deal uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it, it's an 11 and a quarter coupon. It's sitting right next to a bunch of other bonds in the capital stack with a three and three quarter coupon, four and one eighth coupon. Um, massive differential in that cost of capital. Um, and, and, and that is the cost of capital for these businesses to access the market right now. Obviously, if your entire capital structure looks like that, you know, you're not going to get commensurate EBITDA growth and, and that's problematic. All right, well, certainly is, but I mean, do you think management teams have learned a lesson here? I mean, do you, do you think that was going to be zero percent interest rates for as long as it was? Look, I, 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 think, I, I think the issue is um, companies did a great job in 2021. Uh, refinancing, and I think 2020 scared a lot of businesses. Once you had access to the capital markets in the back half of 2020 into 2021, companies did a great job putting in longer dated, lower cost of capital, particularly on the on the fixed rate side. Um, where you are seeing these rate moves more acutely affect businesses um, that are primarily you know, bank debt heavy capital structures, uh, where you know that is coming through on a quarterly basis that increase in interest rates. Um, you know, as you used to start to see those fixed rate bonds um, that are rolling off, as the maturities are starting to come due, that's when I think you're going to start seeing you know more problems within the capital structure. So, you know, the, the writing's on the wall. You can see it coming ahead, but it's a problem that you might not have to deal with for another couple of years. All right, Ryan, appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining right. us on Trade Talks, and thanks for joining me. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Market Two Quarter at Nasdaq.